welcome to the last session of this awesome conference. Um, and I know oh, this is the only session that is between you and your weekend, so we promise to make it very interesting. In fact, we're going to have you rolling in the aisles and, as we play the music uh, in a few minutes. <laughs> um, this uh, session is called The Story Behind the Story, and the three papers here have all taken a different uh, approach to it. Um, one paper traces the uh, influences and the origin of a certain style of content. Um, another paper looks at uh, audience demographics and what uh, a newspaper can take away from their one year's worth of analysis and how that might affect story coverage and uh, prioritization. And uh, the, the third paper talks about how journalists can expose the story behind the story, what went into producing the content uh, and the code that goes with it, something that's been discussed quite a bit in this conference, and they give you two case studies on how that's done. So the first paper is going to be called, is um, Playing with Pop Culture, Writing an Algorithm to Analyze and Visualize Lyrics from the Musical Hamilton. Um, it'll be presented by Joel Eastwood and Eric Hinton from the Wall Street Journal. So come on up, gentlemen. And they're going to talk about um, the genealogy of rap and hip-hop music and um, the patterns inside music and, 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 and the lyrics and how you can do all kinds of useful things with it. All right. Hello. How's everyone doing? <laughs> Great. Resounding. All right. Yeah. Um, so we're here at the end of a very long weekend to try to bring a little bit of excitement and talk about something that hopefully is going to be fun and musical. Uh, and to start, we're, so we're talking about the musical Hamilton. Uh, my name is Joel Eastwood. I'm a journalist sort of by trade, uh, and I work in the graphics department at the Wall Street Journal. And uh, I'm Eric. Um, I was like, a lot of things by trade, I guess, but now I'm a programmer. <laughs> so um, just by a show of hands, who here has heard, just heard of the Broadway musical Hamilton? Okay, 90%. Keep your hands up if you've listened to it, like you've listened to the soundtrack, you've watched the video. Keep your hands up if you've seen it, like in person. Nice. On Broadway or off Broadway? Wow, okay. Those are, they know what's up. Um, so if you don't know, uh, Hamilton is a wildly successful Broadway musical. It's nonstop. Nonstop, hip hop. Uh, it's broken all kinds of uh, Broadway records. It's gotten attention from everyone from the White House on down. Um, and we're just going to kind of walk you through a story that we did on Hamilton, our thought process, uh, the various computation involved, uh, and the lessons that we learned from it. Um, so first of all, uh, our goal, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, so, you know, one of the problems that I often find, and this is kind of one of the things I'm really interested in, data viz or interactives or whatever, is like, we don't make fun things very often um, because, and we are, get so preoccupied with like, clarity of like showing people this kernel of truth we've found like and it's all about how well can we pull this out of the light and just you know if we put it on the right pedestal with the right color scheme and the right you know layout and all that jazz um, then users users will understand this truth we can impart to them but I think that that's like a failed model of like both cognition and interaction and truth and you know other isms um, and I think that like ultimately what we should be doing is not focusing on like the mastery of tools and the mastery of truth but we should be focusing on how we can get people to interact with stories in, f in special ways, in fun ways, and play with our stories so that they leave them with deeper understandings and can go on to you know, keep thinking about them, and, you know, get them stuck in their head and their hearts. So TLDR, we liked Hamilton. <laughs> and, and rap. We knew that other people liked Hamilton. We thought, what can we do to, ab about the musical Hamilton that people would find interesting and was new and novel? Um, so what we decided to do was visually abstract the rhyme schemes within Hamilton and present them uh, in a cool way. So this is what the interactive actually looks like. So you load, you see the headline, you scroll down, and then you get to press play. And this is what happens. How does a bastard, orphan, son of a whore and a Scotsman, dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean? By providence impoverished and squalor, grow up to be a hero and a scholar. So that is the opening verse of the musical Hamilton. What we've done is use an algorithm to take the lyrics, to decompose them into all their individual syllables, and then algorithmically identify which syllables are rhyming, and then try to visualize that in a way so that you can follow along to the music karaoke style and understand what's happening. After we've done that, we sort of take it a step further and identify different types of rhyme, so perfect rhyme, uh, end rhyme, internal rhyme, 
And then we kind of bring it all together and show the various influences of a musical like Hamilton, which is sort of merging uh, two different genres. So a classical musical theater, such as Pirates of Penzance, as the computer freezes. Okay, you get the idea. There's a lot going on there, and essentially what we try to do is uh, pick out visual patterns that sort of explore visually how Hamilton uh, draws its influence from sort of traditional rappers. Um, okay, so we're just gonna run through how the algorithm works and then a little more about what we learn, learned from it. So, um, some key things to know about rhyme. No one really knows what rhyme is and how it works. Rhyme is kind of a strange combination of some uh, sonic and morphological and phonetic characteristics of words as, as well of you know, throw in human expectation and throw in all kinds of things. So we don't really know what rhyme is. We have different, you know, definitions of it. Oh, it happens when vowels are repeated, but, you know, end syllables are changed. But no one really, like, it's very hard to actually quantify rhyme. So basically what we do is we take the words, pull them apart into their component syllables using the CMU, uh, the syllabified CMU pronouncing dictionary. There's a mouthful for you. Um, and we pull it apart into its, its syllables. Then we basically build a graph where we relate every syllable syllable to the other one based on how well they possibly rhyme given their context, build this big, you know, kind of tree or it's more of a graph, and then we cluster those rhyming pairs into families based on how well they probably rhyme with each other, which builds this kind of, you know, four, five or six different families of rhyme, and those represent those different colored lines you saw in the visualization. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of, like, computer science-y words that we could use here, like the final output is annealed so that it looks like nice and you can see the patterns more easily. But like, we can say, save that for offline and make each other feel like very smart by talking about them. If, if you want all the nitty gritty details, we wrote a methodology and the paper goes into a lot more uh, component detail. Frankly, we think it's all kind of boring and we want to talk more about the fun things that we learned. Totally. So, skipping right along. Uh, so after we'd done all this heavy lifting on the algorithmic side, which was almost entirely Eric, we said, okay, now how do we present this? Um, because we realized that rhyme is tricky in that it's something that intuitively you can hear, right? If any of you listen to a song, you could pick out most of the rhymes in it. Um, but we don't really have an established data viz form for showing that. We have sheet music for connotating like, like pitch. Um, but, you know, other than sort of highlighting lyrics, it's not like a comment, it's not a bar chart, it's not a line chart. So we started um, by just sort of doing early mocks in which we would just sort of go through the lyrics and partly by hand, partly by ear, try to just highlight um, all of the individual uh, rhyming syllables uh, and then try to sort of build this, these kind of weird block charts, which served well, but they weren't terribly intuitive. You had to explain to somebody uh, what they were looking at and how to read this. But boy, um, isn't this the thing that like someone would like love to like blow up and put on a poster and be like, data is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> From there, we progressed to this uh, command line tool. So this was an early version of the actual script that we were writing. So essentially, the top portion that you see there are the actual uh, lyrics. Uh, and then you get sort of a, a look at its inner workings, the way it's turning every syllable into its component sound. And then it's colorizing each of those syllables sort of loosely into families. Uh, and then it's trying to sort of display those families uh, in, a, in a linear fashion. And so what, essentially, we're double encoding here so that every syllable family has both its own color as well as its own line. Uh, which just to really hammer home how easy it is to you know, be able to make the connections between which families are which. And one cool thing about doing this in the terminal was it meant that as we were developing the code and honing the algorithm, we could actually use the terminal in like real time. I pr I'm a Vim guy, so like I never left my terminal the whole time and I just could see how my changes affected the things without having to like reload a page or anything like that. The original version wasn't developed in browser. Uh, and then the big takeaway we realized is like animation kind of cracked a major problem we had, which is that you don't just want to be able to sort of see this all laid out. You know, a song is linear, things happen in sequence, uh, the, the beat and the rhythm is extremely important. So if we could sort of capture that in a way of animating it, and we went through many different iterations of, okay, how do we animate this? What are we trying to emphasize? Are we trying to emphasize the lyric or the syllable or the stress or what? Uh, a big breakthrough came when we kind of struck upon using the conceit of a musical staff because there's already kind of a bit of sort of an, an intuitive uh, knowledge of like, you know, everyone has seen a musical staff and understands, you know, that every line is its own discrete family. Um, we went through many, many uh, versions on this. This process was a lot of user testing. It was a lot of do this, show it to someone who's never seen it before, don't explain it to them, just say what does this look like, uh, see if they get it, if not, 
uh, repeat. We, we went, there was like one night where we spent like um, many hours like going through old experimental like John Cage scores and that was when we knew like somewhere around like I don't know, this point that we had like gone too far into the abyss. Um, <laughs> uh, so here's pretty much the version that is like what you see uh, and this is where we struck upon the realization that if we could just sort of animate every syllable as it came in in synchron uh, synchronized with the music then that would sort of really it's we're basically triple encoding uh, what's happening here because you've got the family on its own line it's its own color and it's connected to the syllable as it comes in and this is sort of the final form well this is a very close to a final form uh, the final sort of conceit that, that we realized that would really sort of take this that one final step further was essentially adding the y-axis um, that we see in this final version. Um, like, oop, oop. So, so essentially this is our final form. So we have a y-axis that essentially gives you the phonetic sound that corresponds to each family. You have your colors uh, that correspond to uh, sort of all of the syllables that uh, are echoing or include the sound in that family. Uh, you can sort of play or hover any of these. Yeah, there should be audio there, but it's not perfect. Uh, <laughs> um, and finally, we've got your full uh, lyrics laid out down at the bottom here, again, with the colors included, uh, to really try to drive that connection home. And then we just want to add that also at the bottom of the, uh, at the interactive, there's a make your own, where you can either put in some of your, uh, some like pre-made ones. I have no idea why this page is not responding. Should we load it? Yeah. Where you can either put in your own or uh, use you know, some other famous ones. Oh, I think we've lost our internet connection. That makes sense. Um, but anyway, so you can put in, and this is like the core of the project was that because we build it in an algorithm in browser, users could use the exact same tools we were to analyze Hamilton to compare their own lyrics or their favorite rapper's lyrics or their favorite rapper's favorite rapper's lyrics. Um, and um, that, was, that was a fun thing that we really thought that users would enjoy because that is what allowed them to build on top of it. Um, as we'll discuss later, people build on top of it in some pretty cool ways. So yeah. So that's just an example of the rhyme algorithm sort of at work. So you click analyze, Ooh. click analyze, and it essentially in real time takes the lyrics you've given it uh, and it tries to figure out um, what all the rhyming syllables are in that. Uh, and these are just sort of the easy buttons we've added, but you can throw in any text you want, any kind of uh, rap lyric or hip hop lyric or poem. Uh, and that was kind of uh, for us the most interesting uh, conclusion from this project was uh, the idea of giving people the ability to play with it and not just to sort of passively present this algorithm and its conclusions, but to give people the opportunity to make their own and kind of make their own uh, intuitive discoveries. Because you often hear these stories of like big data, you know, success stories like the Panama Papers or Snowden or any of these kind of things. I mean, Snowden being a little less, um, well, no, um, but like less data and more like ex like old fashioned journalism, right? Because they weren't dumped to the public. But there's a reason that like this, there's this tremendous sense of failure that comes along with all these big dumps also. Like how much of these things had a huge impact on, you know, how people change public policy or actually reacted to things more or less people just go along living their lives because there is little attention paid to you know, how um, it changes a user's life and how you can give them the tools in which to actually experience the things rather than just kind of have this cold intellectual cerebral understanding of what changed. Um, so we want it to really give users the tools to um, start thinking about the things and start experiencing them simply rather than like didactically telling them this is the truth we've learned. Uh, and so the final portion of this is getting sort of the user response, um, which we were thrilled by. Um, you know, obviously we had hoped this would be well received because it's Hamilton and everybody loves Hamilton. Um, what, what really uh, blew us away and that we were really happy with is people started using this algorithm in ways we just hadn't anticipated. Um, so some of them would use it to just, you know, like we anticipated, just put in a lyric from your own favorite rap artist uh, and be able to sort of map it out. But we began to see people who would try to write their own poetry and use it as like a suggestive tool to like, oh, like, you know, the, the algorithm is showing me where I could improve a rhyme or where I could try a more interesting rhyme. We heard from teachers who were saying, well, this is an amazing teaching tool because I can stick things in in real time and I can also, you know, we sort of use the visualization to explain concepts like perfect rhyme and imperfect rhyme and internal rhyme uh, and they can, they can learn from all of those. And, and finally, one of the big kind of surprising takeaways was like the importance of what your examples and your demos are. So like we had like 
you know, in early versions, we had every like famous rap stanza that you can think of, every famous bar analyzed. And of course, the social team was like, we have to lead with the Eminem one. Everyone knows that. And you're like, well, that represents a very small part of like the broader, you know, hip hop consuming universe. And it also represents a very white one. And like, so as a result, we talked to, you know, we read what Lin Manuel said. He said he was frustrated with the fact that Eminem was always the comparison used because, you know, the, it, Hamilton is built as this like, you know, multicultural, diverse success, and it, you know, it highlights the kind of artists that are often relegated to, if any coverage at all, you know, just like trade, you know, like you know, rat mags or whatever. So he was trying to, you know, say like, look how close this is to poetry, look how close this is to all, to theater, all of these high quote unquote forms. So we wanted to mirror that. So that's why we chose like Lauren Hill as our lead, um, you know, our lead example. And in our easy buttons, we like worked with, you know, both our writers and historians to like come up with really representative samples rather than just the easy ones that come to mind that reflect the same biases, you know, that are kind of lame. <laughs> and the, the highest praise we got was the creator of Hamilton, Lin-Manuel Miranda himself, tweeting out that not only did he like the project, but that he was really impressed that the Wall Street Journal uh, was the one uh, writing about it. Thank you. <laughs> The next paper is titled Multidimensional Analysis of Gender and Age Differences in News Consumption. It will be presented by Jisun An, and her, and her co-author is Hewun Kwak. They're at the Qatar Computing Research Institute. Hi, thank you for staying late with us. Uh with us. Um, uh, hi, I'm Tisana from Qatar Computing Research Institute. Today I will talk about uh, our recent analysis on demographics and the online news consumption. Do you remember the time the Ebola hit the USA in 2014? I also heard that it was also called as a fear Ebola. Um, in South Korea, we had a similar outbreak, but in a much larger scale. On 20 May, 20th May 2015, South Korea reported the first case of the Middle East, um, <coughs> Middle East, <laughs> yeah, res respiratory syndrome. I don't know what happens with the slides though. Um, yeah, Middle East syndrome, um, AKA MERS. Uh, there were 186 uh, cases with a death toll of 36 and 16,000 people were quarantined. So the MERS was a deviant event. There, there were like more than 100,000 news articles published during this time. And to me, it was very interesting to see how um, the, all the, these changes of the news angles. So they first rep uh, focused on like reporting newly confirmed uh, patients, and then they discussed like how, why, and this outbreak uh, started. And then as it gets serious and it lasted more longer than expected, uh, they focused more on economical impact, and they were blaming like government and the president for this whole accident. And the reason I brought this news story is actually to introduce um, our four dimensions of news. So here, the middle uh, MERS outbreak can be a one instance of the issue dimension, an issue I refer to as an event or happenings. And, and, and there's an angle dimension within particular issue. And angle is a similar concept to a follow-up story that show um, um, with a different viewpoint or the aspect. And at the highest level, there's a topic which often relates to the news sections. And at the lowest level, there's a news items. We later realized that naming could have been better, but for now, we will use our own definition of default dimension of um, news. And then the entire collection of the news published in South Korea in 2015 can be summarized or categorized according to these four dimensions. And given this conceptual categorization of news stories, uh, we aim to answer the following question. How differently do demographic groups consume news at each dimension? And why do we do this? I mean, it can be benefit, I mean, understanding the patterns of news consumption uh, can be beneficial to news providers to uh, pitch or place the news stories um, better or for computer, computer scientists to design a better way of personal, uh, personalization in news reading experience and even to a society because it makes us to understand how the different parts of the society perceives a particular issue. So, uh, so it is fairly well studied that the gender gap exists in topical preferences in news consumption. 
um, like women are reading more in entertainment or religion, but then uh, uh, men are re uh, reading more sports or the tech or the financial news. But then those studies are only conducted through the surveys or the lab experiment. And surprisingly, all these other three dimensions are less explored, mainly due to lack of the data um, across various news media over the long time of period. So our research goal um, is that we, uh, we aim to uncover the gender and age differences in news consumption. Specifically, we quantify such differences in four dimensions, actual news item, topic, issue, and angle. So we use the, um, the DAOM, uh, we collect the data from the DAOM, which is the second most popular uh, news portal in South Korea. And it's a, like a Google News, like it's a news portal. But the one thing that, that is different is 41% of Korea access to Daum News day, a weekly basis. So it's fairly, uh, fairly have a like, large viewership. And it, like, like other news media sources, it also provides like the most viewed articles or the most commented articles. But a unique function is that um, it provides a most viewed articles on a particular day for different demographic groups. So uh, we collected this data for an year period, um, and then so we had um, around 100,000 uh, listed news items with uh, 53,000 unique news titles. So I will quickly overview the methodology. I, will, I won't go details. Uh, for categorizing the news, uh, we use the meta information embedded in the news URL. So in the given example, this will be categorized as a society. And here is the distribution of the news topics uh, for each uh, demographics uh, for each topic. Here, the five left bar is the um, female groups, and the five right bar is the male groups. So you can see a certain differences in, by gender. But then we have this weird particular patterns uh, from the age 50 male, um, like more than 80% of the popular news were, from, were in politics. And the most popular topic was society. And the full issue, we develop a algorithm that discover issue-specific categories. Uh, basically, we use the topic modeling, but we also consider the when the issue happened. And then we mapped all the news articles back to those issues. And there were some issues that wasn't mapped to those issues, and we consider them, we treat them as a standalone issue. In the end, we had the 41,000 issues. And for Angle, we rather focused on how different the news titles are uh, across the demographic groups for a particular issue. So we examine the most discriminative words in the news titles across demographic groups by using chi-square test. And for, in this study, uh, as a preliminary ex experiment, we focus on one particular issue, the MERS outbreak that I introduced. So I will uh, uh, report some of the uh, results of our analysis. So in quantifying the topic similarity um, of across the different demographic groups, we simply computed the Jaka similarity, which is defined as given the two sets of news items, uh, the number of common news items divided by the number of union uh, news items. So here and uh, here, and then we compare this Jaka similarity across all pairs of the demographic groups, and the results are shown as a heat map. So here, uh, Age 10 females and age 20 females have a Jaka similarity of 1.15, uh, meaning that they have 50% uh, of news items in common. And uh, the same pair of the male groups has a less uh, uh, similarity, 6% uh, of news items in common. And overall, uh, uh, within same sex groups, the similarity increases as the age differences decreases. Uh, it, uh, um, with a female has a stronger tendency than males, with an exception uh, with the age 10 female and age 10 male groups, so teenagers are slightly different. And the, we also observed the very low uh, topical uh, news items similarity across the, across the um, different uh, sex uh, groups. So like age 40 male and the age 50 males had uh, no common news items at all with the female groups. So from this research, uh, we can conclude that the set of popular news items that female consume is very different from uh, what uh, male consume. 
the full topic, uh, we first get the proportion of the news items for different topics, and, and that can be a topic vector for each group. And then we compute the cosine similarity, which is the uh, cosine, a measure of the cosine angle of these two vectors. And the results are ranged from minus one to one, minus one meaning that it is the exact opposite and one is the, the, is the exact the same. And again, we did a, we compute the similarity across all pairs of the de demographic groups. And uh, in, the, in this heat map, it shows the overall, you see the very high topical similarity. And the one thing that I missed is that in the, this uh, ranked list, um, they actually didn't include the sports and the entertainment news. Uh, because they had uh, this policy. Uh, so the, topic, the high topic of similarity, just given it in your mind that entertainment and sports news are not included. So what we observed is that within same sex group, uh, topic preferences are very similar to each other. Um, but then we have this weird pattern that uh, age 50 male group has a very distinct topical preferences. And this was uh, mainly because they exclusively per consume the political news. And, and again, um, furthermore, the male groups split it into two other groups. So the age 10 male and age 20 male groups uh, were having similar topical preferences with the female groups than age 30 or 40 groups. So um, in summary, um, we can say that, so our result also supports the traditional sex typed um, news consumption theory. However, it further reveals that such um, news uh, differences can be revealed, um, driven by um, age 30 to 50 male groups than the age 10 to 20 male groups. And the, for the issues, uh, we looked at the two, sorry, just uh, my timer is ringing. Oh, sorry, uh, so, so for the issue similarity, we measured to what extent they pay attention to different issues. So for, each issue, uh, we count the number of the consecutive days that they pay attention to each of the issue. And then for, so here in this example, the group A uh, paid uh, um, attention to issue one for 20 consecutive days. And then we ranked all these issues based on these um, uh, days, which we called it as a lifetime. And then we compare the ranking correlation uh, Spearman's ranking correlation coefficient as a measure of the issue similarity. So from here, here you see that age 40 male and the age 50 male group has the 0.89 as a uh, issue similarity, meaning that the rank, the two of the ranked list of the uh, most popular issues are, they, they are very similar to each other. But what is surprising is that um, those the issue similarity across the different same sex, uh, di different same sex, different sex groups are fairly high. But given that they have not much like news items in common, consumed um, such high similarity was quite interesting to me. And we had these two exceptions of uh, age ten males and age uh, ten female groups, and they are they were less alike with the other groups in consumed issues. And another thing we want to note is that age 50 male groups had a similar issue preferences with other groups, but then in the topical issue, uh, topical similarities, they had a very low uh, similarity. So considering that having the high similarity in the issue, I think that was also quite interesting. So finally, by the angle, um, we focus on this particular issue, MERS outbreak. Um, and then we did a little bit of the content analysis. So we first selected the uh, words that appeared at least 10 times across all the new site articles of uh, matters, which was uh, 264 words out of 19,000. And then uh, for each of the demographic group, we ranked all these words by their frec uh, frequencies in their news articles. And then we computed uh, Spielman's ranking correlation coefficient for all the pairs. And here again, we, um, here are the, some of the findings that we, look, uh, we found. So the popular news are similar within the same sex groups, but then female groups are more similar uh, to each other than the male groups. And then age differences again matter, except the age 10 males uh, uh, and age 10 female groups. And the 
the similarity across the different sex groups were very low. So we want to note that these patterns were also observed um, in the I, uh, news item um, analysis. And finally, just to have some idea about, um, so what, uh, to, to give some idea about the content itself, so uh, we look at the most discriminative words um, uh, here, even though it's some, uh, the labels are missing. The first and the second were uh, the age 20 and the age 40 female groups. And if you look at, look at the first three words, then uh, they, were more, the, they were more interested in where the patients want traveled or whether there is a new cases or not, whether the school will be closed or not. But then these two were the age 20 male and the age 40 male groups, and they were more interested in what are the responsibility of the presidents or the politicians uh, um, regarding these issues. So in summary, um, so we analyze the news consumption of different demographic groups in four dimension, topic, issue, angle, and the news items. And we found that while the news items uh, similarity was very low, topic and the issue simil uh, preferences were um, quite similar across groups, but then angle preferences were not. Meaning that um, groups are generally interested in the similar issues, but they read the news articles from different angles, indicating that angles makes what news consumption looks different. And some, the final thought is that, so we, it was a sort of the side project we started, but then we learned so much from this analysis. Um, so we believe that the sophisticated content analysis is a key for better understanding of this consumption. And we will get into more of this angle uh, dimension of analysis. And with more aggregated data publicly available, um, the computer scientists can do more analysis to help both news provider and the both readers. Thank you. Thank you. The next paper is titled, Towards Editorial Transparency in Computational Journalism. It will be presented by Jennifer Stark. This is joint work with Nick Diakopoulos at the University of Maryland. Hi. Um, so I work with Nick Diakopoulos um, at the University of Maryland College of Journalism. Um, I come from neuroscience, so I have a, a PhD in neuroscience. So the conversation about transparency and reproducibility is really important to me, um, knowing how difficult it is to do in science, and I think it's something that can be very, uh, is very worth pursuing in journalism. So what do we even mean by transparency? Well, um, uh, here I have a quote from a paper um, by Duza saying that the ways in which people, um, both inside and external to journalism, are given the chance to monitor, check, and criticize and even intervene in the journalistic process. Um, but what does that really mean for, for us, and, what, and what, what are the examples of this? Um, so, so I'm going to be presenting two examples of where we've tried to um, make our process transparent. Um, and this can depend very much on the context of what, uh, what the journalist is trying to do. So we present two examples. One is a storytelling example. Um, where we have a story that we published in, we, we published earlier this year in the Washington Post. And then the second one is tool making. So um, either we're making tools for journalists to use in the newsroom for gathering data or disseminating um, information. And the process for transparency can be very different uh, depending on uh, what kind of approach, what you're doing. So the uh, main question is why should we even bother sharing our work? Um, I'd like to explain some of the benefits to both yourselves as journalists, um, benefits to other journalists in sharing the work, and how it could benefit the audience. So um, one of the goals of the lab is to um, accountability. Um, so to, to promoting accountability um, with your work can improve your own work. So. Um, I tend to try and rush things. I get excited about what I'm finding out and what I'm ana analyzing, and then I go down this trail of, um, I think someone named it the, the walking path or something. And uh, it happens all the time. It's very easy to do. 
So working with the idea of someone else is going to be reading the work and trying to understand what you're doing can help to at least slow me down and think more critically about what I'm trying to do and what analysis I'm trying to do next and why I want to try this next statistical analysis or why I want to collect this data set. Um, so before publishing the story, knowing that somebody else is going to be looking at how you came to your interpretation, your conclusion, um, it can help to uh, get you to double check your work and every single step that you've done to understand what, whether the code that you're including is critical to um, the story that you're telling. Um, double check your analysis and your in conclusions interpretation. It also helps you think about how you document the process, so um, which can facilitate your own future work. So if, if you document exactly what you've done and how you've done it and why you did it, if you have to do something similar in the future, you don't have to go through a day or more trying to remember what you did and why you did it um, and then worry about whether that was even the right thing to do at the time as you, you know, double think everything. It can also help, so that's helping future you. Um, it can also help fellow journalists. So um, I think some people mentioned earlier today and, and yesterday as well that oftentimes the code that's written is, it's one-off, it's for a one-off project, you'll never have to do it again. But I think there's lots of pieces of code that we do use over and over again. Um, and so if you have this properly documented and explained and commented, then it can help yourself and other journalists who want to do similar work, either within your own newsroom, um, within your, uh, uh, in academia, or, um, uh, or within the field in general, and other journalists. It can also help to stimulate alternative stories and viewpoints. So perhaps if you're sharing your data, um, another journalist or um, another newsroom or um, someone completely different and outside of the field might want to use the data to ch tell a different story, an alternative story, an alternative viewpoint that you may not have considered before um, or be interested in. So it's not necessarily about um, competitiveness between journalists, and if someone else has your data, then you're, you're um, losing some of your... Um, uh, you're not losing your, your position in being able to tell a story before anybody else. Somebody else might have a completely different kind of story to tell. So um, the first example is a, uh, the story that we published earlier in the Washington Post earlier this year. Um, uh, looking at Uber and how they, how their service may be better in some areas of Washington DC compared to other areas. So we were interested to see whether um, some dem demographic um, sets were better serviced by Uber compared with others. Um, and we found evidence that suggested that um, tracts Census tracts with um, high percentages of people of color experience longer wait times for a car. So for this, we have a lot of code in collecting the data, in analyzing, um, and then the data itself. So each of the, these different um, steps may require different considerations when you think about sharing your code um, or, or sharing um, the data. So uh, we had uh, the, the raw data that we collected. Um, so we wanted, we first looked at um, showing it on GitHub, um, but GitHub has a size limit of 500 megabytes, and our um, CSV file was, a, was over two gigs, I think. Um, so then we considered using Google Drive, which is free, and most people are familiar with Google Drive. Um, so something to consider is, is the size of the data set that you want to share. Um, we also wanted to consider the open source. Uh, we want to make everything open source and we want everything to be free because journalists, someone else mentioned earlier today, are poor. We can't afford to pay for expensive software. Um, so if everything's open source, then that's great. So GitHub, as we mentioned earlier, um, I think uh, BuzzFeed, Washington Post, New York Times, um, ProPublica, a bunch of different news outlets already use GitHub to share um, either the code or, or, um, or tools that they've built. Um, and also Jupyter is a, um, it's a notebook style of sharing code where you can insert comments, you can have um, charts embedded into the code, so you can, it's quite easy to follow um, if you're from outside and if code is not your 
um, is not your main part of your job if you're not used to working with code. So this is an example of um, GitHub. Um, so we have uh, the folders where you have your code, your data sets. Um, you can post issues uh, if you wanted, and you can also see up here how many people are watching your repository, how many people have starred it, and how many people have forked it. So um, for those of you who are not familiar with GitHub, um, you can, if, you, if somebody starred your project, then they'll get updates of whenever you make edits to your, the project, if you could submit extra code or extra data or whatever. And if someone forks it, they've basically copied your repository into their own GitHub account, so they might be making their own edits um, to the code to make their, their own versions of whatever you've done. Um, so something else that, that GitHub does nicely is it allows you to um, have a, a readme um, file where, which can explain um, where you can put your documentation uh, for your code and project in a nice, clear way. So you can have links to, uh, this is a link to the, um, to the original article, um, and then we can explain exactly how the data was collected and how the code was, was written and what each part of the code does. Um, so that we've got sharing and uh, of how the data was collected, processed, wrangled, and analyzed. Then we have, um, we included interim process data, because if somebody wants to use your project, they might not necessarily want to run it from the very, very beginning. They might only want to check um, you might only want the last part of it, or like to pick up the project from a certain point. So it's important to also save um, interim process data in CSV files, which are easily accessible by anybody. Um, also, if possible, try and do every step in a programmatic fashion, because that way you minimize um, mistakes when you do it again yourselves, or if other people want to replicate your study. So that's not always possible. Um, one of some of the maps that we did was in Carto DB, or Carto now. And, um, and so you, it's difficult to, to write. Obviously, that's, you can't code that. Um, and sometimes with APIs as well, uh, it might be better to sometimes put links within the readme to their own documentation of how to use their APIs rather than you re redoing it yourself. Um, so Twitter was another one. We had a Twitter bot that retweets comments from articles. Um, uh, to help um, in response to people tweeting the link to the article itself. Um, so this needed a different approach because this is a tool. We don't have data uh, associated with this. So um, we wanted to uh, document how to use the tool and install the tool and then how to access the different APIs for, for commenting um, platforms like Discuss or the New York Times' own commenting platform. Um, so we went with a, code, a language agnostic configuration file. People don't have to know language, uh, programming or, or have their favorite programming language to use the configuration file. Um, the challenges were um, how, to how much to parameterize. You can make so much, um, uh, you, you, we, we wanted people, we wanted to facilitate people um, personalizing this for their own newsroom or their own, um, newspaper, but, um, but and then everyone's got their own specific requirements for this. But then how much, where do you draw the line of how personalized we can make it? Um, so that was a challenge. And another challenge was case by case um, uniqueness. So we, we dealt with that by having um, a part within the code itself that um, people who are a bit more Python savvy could edit that to make it work for their own um, platform. Documentation. Evil, it does take a lot of time, but I would urge you to think of it as an investment of your time. Um, the, the more you, it was, I think it would take longer to begin with, and then once it becomes more part of your process, more part of your workflow, it will be easier and quicker to do. Um, and you know, with, with uh, documentation in, uh, in the GitHub repository, um, and then including links between your article and the GitHub repository to help people make, um, to cross-reference. Licenses is also something that needs to be considered and it's kind of hard to navigate if you're new to it, but nobody should really be using your code or your data if you don't have a license attached to it. Um, so these are some links for different code licenses if you're sharing code, data licenses if you're sharing data, 
And advice for if you have a project that involves both code and data, you can have the two parts separately licensed. Um, so why share our work? It's difficult to really know if someone is actually using the code that you're, or the data that you're sharing. And so it's difficult to measure really how useful this is and why we should invest our time in it. Um, I mean, as I showed earlier, we have, um, you know, we can, we can kind of see how many people are interested by looking at how many stars or forks that we have on a GitHub repository. Um, and one of these, this is a list of people who have forked the project. One of these belongs to Sunlight Labs. Um, and we've had emails from, um, and phone calls from people interested in, um, in our work in terms of how it could change policy uh, for transport and AIOP, for example. Um, this is the just for comment bot. But also for individual hobbyists or people who are, um, who are interested in like, civic, civic data. So this is an example from um, Kate Rabinowitz, who likes to make really cool visualizations for D, uh, brand DC. Um, and some of her work's been published in, in these outlets. And she used our Uber data, um, analyzed it herself in R, and made this interactive map of uh, um, if you select a region in DC, and then you can see um, the, the worst surge pricing across DC and across uh, days of the week and times of the day. So some final thoughts. Um, it's, uh, do we want to reinvent the wheel all the time or is it possible to reuse other people's code if they have it online and it's easy to, to find? Whether it's easy to find is, uh, whether GitHub is the best place to share the code, I don't know that yet. Um, if I'm looking for code, I normally do look at Stack Overflow. So someone from here, I think, has already made this Stack Overflow uh, suggestion for a journalist Stack Overflow. Um, so go ahead and, and go there and put your suggestions. Um, and, and someone also mentioned in this meeting about whether we can share data or da share files. Um, there's one company called Quilt Data who I haven't used, um, so I don't want to uh, say that everyone should use them. But um, they are, they, they call themselves a repository, a data repository, um, like data, like GitHub's a code repository, they're calling themselves a data repository. Um, and I think it's free, um, but like something similar might be really great for, for sharing data um, or sharing FOIA, uh, FOIA data for journalists. Um, so thank you. Thank you. So we have a hard stop at four, and we have time for a few questions. Um, while people sort of line up, I have a couple of questions. Um, so Joel and Eric, um, why would you apply your technology to something so boring as a musical? Um, how about something exciting like journalism? I mean, you happen to live in a newsroom. Have you considered applying your visualization for some of the stuff that happens there? It seems like every time Trump says something, we go through the same news cycle, and there must be some patterns out there <laughs> that you can mine and highlight. I mean, we, we do visualizations on all kinds of things, and we're at the Wall Street Journal, which means most of our visualizations are boring new stuff, right? We do stock charts, we do line charts, we do all kinds of charts. Um, and so this is sort of, I think, our attempt to say, can we crack out of that bubble just a little bit and try to visualize uh, a topic that doesn't see a ton of visualizations? Um, so like music and arts are obviously areas of huge interest. Um, but there's, there's very few, I mean, there, there are a few excellent ones out there, and we cite them in our paper. Um, but it was mostly sort of our attempt to, to find something a little more interesting and just a little more innovative. Um, and we found sort of within the newsroom, it was, it was a bit of a struggle at first, but we began to get a lot of traction once people realized what we were doing because it was something they'd never seen before. It wasn't just another stock chart. Right, and I would yeah. also argue that things like Hamilton um, are less staged than the election in their own way and are more meaningful to certain people. Um, so much of what we can analyze, you know, comes from just such a, the small surface area of politics that, you know, uh, we get to actually see on, on the news or every four years when suddenly it's all that gets covered, you know. And I think that thing, a lot of social change and a lot of social meaning can come from things. Now, I'm not saying that Hamilton is, you know, perfectly progressive or any of these things, but I think it's important and I think it's important to a lot of people and that's exactly the kind of stories I want to cover. Okay. Um, Jennifer, I have a question about, you know, that there are two use cases for transparency. One is obviously um, accountability. So, so that your audience knows that what you did is right. And the other use case is obviously helping other journalists by reuse. So could you contrast the amount of effort it takes to service these two use cases? Are they very similar? Are they very different? I think it's the 
same. Um, if you, and I think if, if you go for the, the most, if you, if you try and help the person who needs help the most or assume the least amount of knowledge for the person who is gonna be using it, then everyone can benefit. Um, another, so one, one, of the, um, one of the use cases that I thought about just before presenting was um, that Uber themselves can check. And in our phone call, when we asked them for comment, um, they did allude to the fact that they would be checking um, with their own data whether we were telling, whether what we were t saying was accurate or not. Um, and we said, you know, we're going to be sharing everything anyway, so you can just look at, you know, rerun our code and check for yourself. I haven't heard from them, and I haven't seen anything that they've published. They could have just, which I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll just go for like whatever, whatever is the simplest, the, the, be the most explanatory if you can. And I think then anyone, it doesn't matter who's looking at it, that everyone can benefit. Um, and question to you is, is your code available for newsrooms to use? And, if, and would you think there is some adaptation that's required before they use it? Are there assumptions you've made in the Korean context? For example, you, um, it appears that for all users, in Korea, you know their gender, you know their age, and so on and so forth, which may not be an assumption that holds. Have you thought about adapting it to other newsrooms? Yeah, I mean, so our next step is now working with a sort of English-based data set. And the idea is that is now, because we have a very good data sources of the Korean language to the demographic groups, and then we are now met, we are sort of building a language model to predict the, from the news title, what is the population of the audience, I mean, demographic distribution of the demographics of the audience of a particular news article. And uh, I mean, these days there are a lot of studies about language compatibility between across the different languages. So like at, at least a sentiment analysis were success to, like uh, just literal translation from English to Korean or English to German or the other way around actually. That was quite, um, accuracy was quite um, high. So we, our uh, next step is, so we will translate Korean word to English word, and then we removed all the issue specific words, and then uh, we built a sort of language model um, based on neutral words, uh, whether they can predict the demographics from um, given a news title. But what's the state of your code? Is this available somewhere, or do you no, plan uh, to make it available? So we just started this project, and um, we are working towards another submission, so after that, there will be some availability. But, but, but for, at the moment, actually, I'm not so sure whether it will work or not. It's an idea. There's a lot of different ideas um, after this um, uh, preliminary work. Um, we actually didn't expect um, that anger was sort of the issue. And then there was a lot, lot of possibility, I think, we can work more. And do you guys have any plans of releasing your code so that other people can use it and put it apply other kinds of music and so, lyrics to it? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question because we haven't released our code uh, publicly. And, and that's not out of uh, any kind of uh, conspiracy or, or, or sure. uh, desire to actually keep it proprietary. It's just the rather embarrassing fact that it's poorly documented, held together by bailing wire, and we do not want to be responsible for maintaining it if we let it out into the wild. We don't want to make a promise we can't deliver on. But, but that said, um, we've talked to a couple of people who are interested in um, themselves to maintaining it or uh, maybe expanding upon it onto like a possibly a thesis, who knows. Um, uh, but uh, we are supporting them and hoping to work with them so that um, they can release something far cleaner than the kind of mess that we put into the project. But, but I think it's, it's a good example because a lot of what Jennifer is saying is, is absolutely right. And I'd love to get to the point where we would be able to roll it out and say, you know, code's all on GitHub, uh, you know, do what you will with it. Um, but instead, we're just, we're just afraid that, you know, because we just haven't spent the time on it and we feel like we don't have it in a place um, where we can safely do that. Um, so we're happy to give it to anyone who would like to take a look at it, um, but with all those caveats. The code's kind of like Any uh, audience outside. questions? Um, well, one last question. Um, Jennifer, I was thinking about the Uber data that you looked at, and it seemed like the, the, in, a, in, your, in your Washington Post article, you talk about how um, you don't believe that Uber, Uber has had a plan to, uh, to discriminate against you know, colored regions in, um, uh, in Washington. So there must be another reason. Either the algorithm is flawed in some way, or 
maybe it somehow reflects the underlying cost of doing business, which has something to do with the drivers and their preference to where they want to go. Um, did you do anything? Did you talk to any Uber drivers? Did you try to find out which of these two it is? Uh, yeah, there's lots of different things it could be. And, and because we, uh, there are several different agendas, there's Uber's agenda, there's the driver's agenda, and there's the rider's agenda, and they're not all aligned. Um, so the, there's actually an Uber driver forum, which is quite fascinating if you want to know what Uber drivers, how they're swapping um, tips and techniques on how to maximize their earnings over the shortest amount of time, what they will accept, what they won't accept, where they'll go, where they won't go, um, how to avoid going to like sketchy areas. Um, so yeah, we are doing follow-up work to explore that further. There's about, f we collected several more data sets to look at that, um, and we'll hopefully be uh, releasing an academic paper on that soon, rather than an article. So it's almost as if you know, I, as an audience member, should be able to request this. You say, hey, I think this is missing. Mm -hmm. Can you, do you have this data? Can you make it available? Can you gather this data? So it seems that dialogue from, with the audience seems important in transparency. Yes, um, yes, and we will be, I'm not really sure how to, um, how to tell the audience, like if we release it as an academic paper, which is the plan at the moment, how do we then tell the original audience that we've got this new, this new data in this new study? So we're not, we haven't really talked about that yet, um, <laughs> but it's something that we, you know, I think we do definitely need to do, and it'll, it'll, whatever we do, the, the new data and analysis and documentation will be online and available. It's just how, how we tell um, the original audience that is there. One, one towards transparency, one of the things that we found that helped us with our transparency is we found and discovered that like the computational linguistics community is like um, not incredibly large and everything you do in it will be seen by every one of them. So um, like we immediately got like several emails from other people ha that had worked on rhyming that we hadn't like credited it because we didn't like use their research. Um, but they were like, why didn't we get credits for this? So then we like that urged us to publish a huge methodology, which I thought was actually really useful, which was neat. And then also we got um, an email from somebody else that was like, I put you know, one of your lyrics in and it didn't give the same output. And they, they tweeted this thing like, the Wall Street Journal is forging their results. And like, that wasn't the case. We had just introduced a bug like, as we were deploying at the last minute. But you know, it was, so one way to be transparent is just you know, make a really appealing project and then everyone will try to you know, poke holes in it, which is a good thing. And, like, I have, and like, that's, that's a, a, a fun challenge. Okay, there are no more questions. Let's thank the speakers one more time. Thank you.